from Washington, D.C., it's theCUBE, covering .next Conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back to the district, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage, and this is our special presentation of Nutanix NextConf, hashtag NextConf. My name is Dave Vellante, I'm here with Stu Miniman and my co-host for the two days of coverage at this event. Adam Jaffe is here, he's the head of infrastructure at Scholastic Corp. Adam, thanks for coming to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. So, is this your first? Dot next? This is my first dot next. What do you There's think? a lot of energy here. It's a tremendous amount of energy, just uh, even in a, you know, the size of the place, but the number of partners that you've got here, the number of customers, it's, uh, it's I'm, I'm really excited to be well, here. Well, the, the yeah. best is yet to come. Nutanix always does a really good job with the keynotes. Yeah, you haven't even opened the keynote yet, yeah, so, and, and there's already and this much energy. Yeah, that was yeah. very crisp messaging. They have great outside speakers. Uh, Robert Gates last year, Condi yeah. Rice, and then, who was the illusionist? They had uh, Oh, did, yeah, year. the, the David, guy in the box, David, David Blaine. David Blaine. That, yeah, David oh, Blaine yeah. held his breath for oh, like nine minutes. It was so, yeah. He was holding his breath underwater <laughs> while the SE for configured. For an entire session? Yeah, <laughs> while the SE configured, because the argument was it only takes eight minutes to configure a Nutanix solution. Wow. And then he came out, after eight minutes, he was, that, you know, he was able to configure the solution. <laughs> Big hugs afterwards, wet hugs. But anyway, <laughs> it's a lot, that's it's a fun cool. show here. Yeah, and it really fun. hasn't even started yet. It started yeah. with, you know, Cube interviews, we've been oh, interview now, interviewing. Now even more excited. Yeah, <laughs> we, so we've been interviewing <laughs> practitioners all day. So Adam, Great. tell us about Scholastic. Sure. Corp. What do you guys do? Sure, so Scholastic, uh, if you went to school in the U.S., you probably heard of Scholastic, sure. but I'll reiterate, it's the, actually the world's largest, not just in the U.S., the world's largest children's big publisher and distributor. Uh, it's also a major education technology firm, so we do uh, a lot of work within the education space with administrators and librarians and other educators uh, in our school system, but we're probably most recognized for our trade businesses, um, which book clubs, which is now called reading clubs, uh, fairs, um, and trade, and just the access to so many of the titles that so many kids in the U.S. have grown so, up so, with. So, so you're making sure the next generation will at least have the opportunity to read? Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting because, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's actually um, just two days ago was the 20th anniversary of the release of the first Harry Potter book, what wow. was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's yeah, yeah, yeah. Stone uh, in the England, and now it was, called, it was called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone in the U.S. And Actually, they did some analysis, some of the articles I was reading about, about uh, literacy, and they actually think that the Harry Potter series has contributed to, um, I guess we're calling them Gen Z, or the post-millennials, or whatever, that grew up with Harry Potter, really improving literacy in the U.S. That's how important uh, some of these, these books that we've published over the years have been, yeah. So, you actually said, uh, you used to call it book club, now you call yeah. it reading club. So, I mean, that's yeah. sort of an indication that you're, your, your business model is evolving, going digital. So maybe Absolutely. talk about some of the drivers there. Absolutely, I mean, that was, that was really one of the key drivers. I think, uh, I've been at Scholastic a long time now, 17 plus years, so I've seen lots of different evolutions have been involved in lots of different technology projects have been involved in different launches. Um, and I think in particular in 2011, when the iPad came out, um, and we saw such a rapid transition with uh, newspapers and periodicals and magazines, myself included, I felt myself going through it, switching to using electronic devices for consumption. The next immediate question is, is this going to make all physical books go away? And so, um, you know, we really pivoted hard into the digital arena at that time because we wanted to be where our constituencies are. And interestingly, we found that actually um, digitization in the children's book space, maybe a little bit in the young adult space, but uh, especially in the, in the elementary school space, has actually been fairly resistant to digitization. Um, it's there, we've, we've got a number of excellent products there, uh, with Storia and, and a number of other products for delivering digital content to our uh, consumers, uh, for primarily children, but um, ultimately, you know, kids still read physical books. Like my, my kids are, 11 and 9, and our house is full of physical books, and, and we really kind of segregate uh, the two together so that they have both the digital reading experience, which is somewhat different from the physical reading experience. Nevertheless, it is continuing to transform our industry. We were talking to Virginia Gambale before. She's an advisor, a strategic advisor to, to a number of companies, board member, investor, and she was talking about capital allocation, and one of the questions I have is, when you guys sort of look at this digital disruption, the change, at what point do you decide, okay, hey, we've got to change or we'll be changed or we need to get ahead of this. How does that all take place? How did it take place in your organization? Do you, were you, were you, was it more reactive, proactive? And 
sort of where are you headed? Um, I mean, I think the, the proactive element around it is that we want to make sure that when our consumers are ready to go digital, we've got a viable product that's reactive to, uh, responsive to as many devices as we think our consumers are going to use. In some in parallel information there, we've been watching uh, really in the last three years how much Google has sweeped into the educational space, and they've kind of done that at, at the uh, expense of Microsoft and Apple. And so um, we see trends like that, and we see how quickly digital can move into um, the educational spaces, which is where the primary, our primary customers are and how we, we sell our products to children. Um, and we knew that we needed to have a viable product there. So I think a lot of things for us are looking at uh, the different channels, making sure that we've got a singular view of our customer and recognizing that our primary customers are really educators, um, that we're connecting with them and we're understanding how they're using our different models, uh, our, our different lines of businesses, um, how they're communicating our products to the parents and children that consume them. Um, and really getting that right balance of physical and digital products in front of every kid. I mean, our core mission is to get, is to get kids to learn to love to read. It's to, to, to generate literacy so that kids become young adults and full adults and they love to read. And that's really what the core mission is behind Scholastic. And however we can deliver the products to satisfy that mission, we're, we're prepared to do that. Yeah. A Adam, that reaching the, the ultimate user in that whole digital transformation, that, that tends to put a lot of stresses on, on infrastructure, which is the, the, the hat you wear. So maybe, you know, explain a little bit, you know, some of those challenges you were having and, and what you've done to, you know, transform on the infrastructure side uh, to meet the requirements of the business. Absolutely, so, so in my role and my various roles that I've had at Scholastic over the years, um, you know, one of the things I've been able to experience is how uh, different parts of the company move at different speeds. Um, and, and some of it is just the nature of the function of the company. You know, your back office corporate space is obviously going to move somewhat slower than your digital engagement in your e-commerce space. Um, but uh, in a role I had several years ago where I was uh, delivering e-commerce and digital services, I, I quickly realized that the traditional infrastructure model simply wasn't going to cut it at this point. Um, we were delivering infrastructure, trying to, to scale it out for very seasonal demand, um, three, six month lead times, trying to stack tech stacks, all stuff that was end up being non undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, so ultimately for us, uh, we, took a, we took a couple of big leaps. One of the big leaps that we took was really moving into the public cloud several years ago. Um, and that worked out tremendously for us. Um, and we've really been able to find the right infrastructure model for delivering our customer engagement experiences has been the public cloud. Um, but when we started to pivot towards the fact that we move physical products, you know, a lot of companies don't necessarily deal with physical products anymore. I, I could be wrong, but I don't know that Facebook has a physical product. Well, I guess they have um, their, their VR, they acquired, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the VR company now, but, uh, but generally, you know, companies that don't deal with physical products, an all-in public cloud model could work pretty well for them. When we were dealing with physical products, um, latency matters, and geodata locality matters, um, and some of the applications that you're dealing with could be very centric to the delivery of your manufacturing and your warehouse operations. So that's actually why, part of why we've been investing in Nutanix, um, because we want to have that same kind of agility with our infrastructure and get out of mixing and matching various vendors' tech stacks to deliver essentially what's a foundational platform for us to deliver business value out of. I'd rather go with one vendor, right, and have a, a finite set of vendors where we're delivering network and compute and storage and the service delivery of our applications on top of that, and Nutanix has worked out very well for us. For this. Appreciate that, Adam, and yeah. uh, it's really interesting. We talk to customers, the two terms that get thrown out are hybrid or multi-cloud, yeah. and you laid out where you're using public cloud. Do yeah. you consider your Nutanix solution, is that private cloud, hybrid cloud, so, so, so mix <laughs> of the two? Right. Does, does that yeah. interact with you know, multi-data center or any other services? Um, you know, I, I, I've kind of avoided the term hybrid cloud yeah. because uh, what was originally marketed to us as hybrid cloud was the idea that your workload is seamlessly portable between all of these different cloud providers. Sure. And we, we kind of realized that that was never really our intent. I think multi-cloud is probably a better model. 
um, for us because we're finding that our various cloud provider services, and if you even scale beyond just the basic IaaS and you get into the PaaS and especially SaaS layer, they're all cloud services, but they're fairly fit for purpose. And a lot of what our role is as a technology organization has moved towards assembling all of these fit for purpose cloud solutions together into a service delivery that we from a technology group can deliver um, to our internal and external customers. And so I prefer the term multi-cloud. So, yeah. so if we could follow up on yeah. the sort of, if I may, skepticism yeah. on hybrid cloud, but this idea of a control plane that spans multiple physical clouds, including mm -hmm. on-prem, is something that, am I understanding that you don't feel that, that that's needed in your organization mm -hmm. or that's not feasible technically? I think it really depends on the applications that we're looking to yeah. deliver through that. So for example, we're finally making our first real foray into containers, and so we've looked at a couple of different technologies. There's a number out there like OpenShift and Kubernetes and so on, and, um, and that's really, we feel, that's the best opportunity for us to find a way to deploy in a true hybrid cloud model where you can actually provision your workload. Maybe not to get so far as to the Priceline type, kayak type view of I want to deploy this workload right now and GCP is the most optimal at this point in time for that. That could be a potential future state, but again, even that feels like it's still a fair amount of undifferentiated heavy lifting for our service delivery. So we find the right mix of products so that we can deliver a kind of a cost optimal workload. Uh, and then in many cases, I think the technology vendors still haven't quite figured out how to handle state. It works great with the stateless part of your applications, but you need to persist your state somewhere. Yeah. And so, we're probably in our earlier stages, I would say, so around so doing right. that service if, what, yeah. what I heard, I think, is you chose by application whether this is going to be something we do in-house, because yep. whether there is the locality, yep. uh, the, the you know, analytics or data processing, something I, yep. I need it for a reason, as opposed to other things, uh, it's undifferentiated, public cloud can take care of it, and Absolutely. there's not a need to yep. own it in-house. Yep. You yeah. said it better than I said it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I. I but but, I, but I, one of the so the question I think Dave's asking is, how do you manage across? Do, do you manage them separately? Do you or want to? Do you want to manage them together? Interesting. You know, or? probably at our maturity level at this point, we're probably really only at the governance stage. Yeah. So we understand what we've got. Uh, we've got a good understanding of our cost structures in the public cloud. Uh, we don't have nearly as good of understanding of our cost structures when we're doing hybrid deployments um, or on-prem deployments. And so um, that's probably as far as we've matured at this point, I would say. Uh, I think we do want to get to a future state where if we take other considerations, in particular latency, the particular nature of that application, or any other sovereignty or legal concerns outside, that we want to maintain maximal flexibility. Uh, part of my role in the infrastructure group is to provide that kind of foundation so porting that workload is seamless across these different cloud providers and those application teams can really position the, the application where is the best fit for purpose aligned with the price performance. So bring it back to like. Nutanix yeah. a little bit. Um, where do they fit? Talk about your journey a little bit. Um, maybe paint a picture of the, the infrastructure, the before, the after, and what yeah. business impact it had. Uh, so there were really a couple of drivers for, for us for Nutanix. Um, one of them is that as we started to, as we've moved a vast majority of our assets out of our data centers to these various cloud providers, we were left with a number of, of physical data centers, and some, in many cases now, the only data centers that we're actually left with are our on-prem data centers that were no longer sized in accordance with the workload we want to maintain. Um, additionally, for us, a lot of the investment of moving to the public cloud, we deferred a lot of the regular capital investments that we tr made in traditional infrastructure, and that you know, we accepted the aging of that infrastructure, but we recognize now that um, there's a fair amount of infrastructure that we need to maintain for these, lo these more local applications. And so, um, I wanted my team, I challenged my team last year really to take a modern approach, right? I don't want to necessarily assemble everything that we've done in the past, but on a much smaller scale to manage the local applications. I know that conversion, in particular hyper-converged, had matured pretty far by 2016. Uh, you know, what are the options out there? And so, when we do our due diligence and we settled on Nutanix, um, we really felt that uh, so both pioneering, at times even a little bit scary, because it was moving into a you know, new foray with us, but I think it's worked out tremendously. Um, we've started in our back office, uh, so that was actually to really for that location some mission critical workload in terms of how we actually do the fulfillment of our physical books, and we're in the process of bringing on a number of those applications off of traditional uh, infrastructure 
future with your segregation between your blade servers and your chassis and your racks and your yeah. fiber storage and your, uh, and your inline uh, networking switches and your storage array and just having one oh. condensed box that's going to run that system so itself. Yeah. For your, for your in-house deployments, is that all Nutanix today or you know, what, what, what's, what's your mix? Um, I'd say Nutanix is probably more in, up, getting up to about the 20% range and stuff. 80% of it is still on traditional. Um, but my goal is about a year from now that will, I don't know if that necessarily will be flipped, but it'll be more than 50% Nutanix. Is, is there, is there yeah. anything that you're waiting for from Nutanix to be able to move those or is it just uh, it's our kind own of budget and process? Yeah, yeah at this process. point we're not, we're not as, even with any of these cloud providers, we're not as much hindered by uh, the technology. The technology at this point is many cases lapsed. Uh, our ability to actually consume it. We're drinking from several simultaneous fire hoses now, and it's which one we turn our mouths to, so. And, and you're taking advantage of Acropolis hypervisor, or? Absolutely, that was also one of the key drivers. Uh, that was the hyper part of it, really. Mm -hmm. I challenged the team, I said, you know, I, I, I want a solution where we can present a general purpose operating system and our application stack, and to me bringing on a third party uh, hypervisor at this point, it's, it just felt like undifferentiated hit a loop. Yeah. So, and yeah. the container discussion, is Nutanix part of that too? Um, probably in our early stages. When we look at our, our workload right now, we don't have any on-prem workload that's been designated with containers, but I know having made the choice of Nutanix, if and when we come to that time, uh, we'll be able to provision that on Nutanix and Acropolis. Yeah, yeah, not, not sure if you heard actually, yeah. this morning there's an announcement of a partnership between Google and Nutanix, so that I should saw. accelerate uh, I some saw. of the that's containers. Very that, yeah. That's very exciting, yeah. yeah. What's exciting about that to you? Uh, well, Google Cloud is one of the, uh, the uh, cloud providers that we actively use today, and I think they've really been a, a great thought leader in this space. Um, we, we use a number of their, their services, and so, um, and I know they've really advanced the community around containers with, with Kubernetes and some of the other technologies that they're working on, and they have a, a, a very you know, mature cloud offering today. Um, and so I think the opportunity for uh, that Google and Nutanix to work more closely together, um, I think a company like Scholastic is really only going to see the fruits, the benefits of that relationship um, and, and ease our, our growth into both platforms. Great. Yeah. Adam, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and sharing Great. your insights and your story. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Okay. All right, keep it right there everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest right after this short break. This is theCUBE, we're live from DC at Nutanix.next. We'll be right back. <laughs>